On this episode of This Week in Space, we talk going interstellar with big thinker Jeff Grayson. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number 60, recorded on May 5th, 2023, Going Interstellar. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that drastically increases your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello and welcome to another episode of This Week in Space, the superluminal edition. I love that word. <laughs> I'm Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief at Ad Astra Magazine with the interstellar Tarek Malik, editor-in-chief at Space.com. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Rod. I'm doing well. Happy, uh, happy Cinco de Mayo, right? Oh, so. Right. <laughs> I just got over yesterday being the May the 4th be with you Star Wars day. That's I right. Guess. I got my my Star Wars shirt to uh, yeah. to celebrate, although I did go see... Uh, Khan the musical uh, to celebrate Star, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan uh, in New York's uh, New York City off Broadway. I highly recommend five stars. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't want to take a lot of time on it, but do give us your best rendition of whenever Khan was said in the show. Well, no, they just say Khan, right? Okay. So. <laughs> Uh, William Shatner at his finest yeah, moment. And we're right. joined today by the returning Jeff Grayson. I believe we had you on during our, our beta phase. Jeff is the Indeed. chief technologist of Electric Sky, a company working on beamed wireless power for aircraft, spacecraft, and launch vehicles, which is a big deal. And uh, hopefully you could talk about that a little more later. And the chairman of the Tau Zero Foundation, which is working on advanced space propulsion for outer solar system and interstellar flight to the great beyond. How are you, Jeff? I am doing well. Thank you. Good to see you again. You too. So before we begin, as many listeners are cringing to hear, we have a new space joke from loyal listener, Paul Romaine. Hey, Tarek. Yes, Rod. Did you hear about the astronauts who broke up? No, no. Tell me. They said they needed some space. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm adding that to the, uh, to the drum roll. As always, of course, we invite you to join Team Tarek and send us your best or worst space joke. We've actually got, I got a really good one the other day that I'm going to have next week. Don't forget, do us a solid. Make sure to like, subscribe, and all those other podcast things because we love you and we know you love us. So before we um, get rolling on our main topic, let's do a couple of quick headlines. Scientists yes. have caught a real-life Death Star, quote-unquote. This is a Space.com headline, no doubt. Devouring <laughs> a planet. First of its kind discovery. Fill us in, buddy. Yeah, yeah. I, I in my defense, uh, the the folks behind this discovery actually put press release colon Death Star. That's exactly what wow. the email read. Um, but no. So basically, for the first time ever, and this is something that you know we we know that stars go through uh, life phases, and one of them is the red giant, our sun will go through its own red giant phase where it swells up and puffs up over time. And if it has any planets around it, it'll just like suck them up, you know, and, and, and that's the end. Uh, that's Earth's fate, sadly, uh, but luckily not for a few billion years. And, and while scientists have seen, uh, you know, they know that that can happen. They've seen evidence that it has happened in the past. For the first, uh, the first time, about 12,000 uh, 12, uh, light years. Do I have that right? That math right? Yes. About 12,000 light years away, they have seen uh, a red giant actually consuming uh, an exoplanet uh, around it. And it's really exciting because it kind of proves those star evolution theories. It gives us an idea of what's going to happen to our own solar system over time. Um, and uh, and so it's it's kind of a, a really neat stage that we haven't seen before uh, in um in in star and the star life cycle uh, and this was made uh it's, it's a uh, a star called uh, ztf slrn 2020 uh, and it's it is a star in our own milky ways disc it's 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 in the constellation aquila the eagle uh but it's just a really exciting discovery to kind of see this over time and of course it's not like they're looking through a telescope and they're watching like a a star go yum 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 on a, on a planet it's it's through light curves and what they can see uh in the spectra of the the star they're seeing but very exciting discovery uh to to know you know that you know 
Earth too will still be <laughs> will succumb uh, to the maw of the sun. Don't tell that to your toddler child because she will look around from experience and ask what happens to her toys, what happens to the pictures on the on the wall, what happens to to the TV, uh, and that'll be a really hard conversation. Well, honey, first they melt, <laughs> then they char, then so will you. I think that's oh. a good thing to tell your your young no. child. All right, <laughs> billions of years. No one has to worry about it. Next up, New Horizons. We have a little bit of a flap going on uh, with our favorite uh, deep space scientist, Alan Stern. Yeah, well, it's it's not just from Alan space. Stern. Com. Yeah, well, this is from Space News, actually. Space News, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. The space, the our, our space. dot com team uh, handled that um, that star story, but uh, Jeff Faust over at Space News has this great uh, this great report from the Outer Planets Advisory Group. That's a group that meets every. Uh, every few months or so, uh, every six months or so, to talk about priorities for outer space exploration. And uh, the New Horizons mission came up during this discussion. Alan Stern was there talking, so were members of the NASA leadership team. And what has happened is that the, uh, the New Horizons team, you know, we've seen them fly by Pluto, big, big history in the making. We've seen them fly by Arakoff, uh, a Kuiper, Kuiper Belt object. And the team has been planning for to, to get a couple of years extension uh, to hopefully try to do something else out there in the corporate belt. They're the only one out there. Uh, and if they can find the new target or find something that they can uh, look at on their path, then they're going to do that. Unfortunately, NASA's current budget plan for them uh, has them scaling back and not doing that planetary science. Instead, maybe transitioning over to like heliophysics, basically studying that edge of the solar system kind of thing that we've seen the Voyagers do when they pass through uh, whatnot. And it, it does sound from uh, Alan Stern as the PI, uh, principal investigator's uh, uh, roles comments, uh, that there's concern that making that transition will kind of get rid of the team, the science team, mm. uh, and the, basically what the spacecraft was designed to do, uh, uh, you know, for, for its foreseeable future. It's kind of the end of, of the mission. So there is a bit of of backlash uh, between like what the science team thinks they, they should be able to do and what NASA says that it wants to pay for right now. Uh, and, you know, it is, it is a weird, uh, uh, you know, a weirdly visible uh, uh, argument going on right now. And it's unclear how that's going to get um, sorted. If they're going to give the new horizons team uh, out at the uh, JHU APL uh, more funding to consider looking at the, uh, the other objects uh, from the different vantage point that New Horizon has out there in the Cobra Belt, uh, or if they're going to really push to transition the spacecraft into this kind of helio uh, uh, physics outpost uh, on, the, on the way out, uh, which could scuttle the team as it sees fit. But it isn't, I, we, I bring it up because New Horizons has been such an icon for planetary exploration, doing uh, things we've never seen before, visiting a planet that we've never seen up close before, uh, and not, not to mention the Kuiper Belt uh, 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 discoveries it's made of these remains of our solar system. So, uh, so it'll be one to watch, and hopefully we'll have some more news in the near future, maybe what it means for the science team, what, how they're planning uh, to get things going, but uh, we'll have to see how that, that develops over time. Well, I hope if they do go into a heliophysics mission that that doesn't imperil what's left the Voyager funding, which I think is in the low millions at this point, because it's just a small team. Yeah. You know, well, I, I think that's the gathering. concern is that if they make that shift, they basically gut the team as it is right now. Right. And it becomes a fundamentally different thing. Instead of uh, uh, funding spacecraft, you're funding instruments now on, on the spacecraft, and that can change how the mission works overall. All right, and uh, quickly, uh, you've got some sky news over on space.com, including the full flower moon eclipse. These names just get better and better. What's a full flower lunar eclipse? Well, as we're recording, there is a full moon uh, on this day, and there's a full moon every month, but uh, and if you think it's boring, it's not. The moon is a beautiful object. It's the easiest uh, sky-watching target in the night sky, and I only bring it up because this, uh, this lunar eclipse is a uh, kind of a, a preview of one to come in the fall. Uh, but it's, it's a penumbral lunar eclipse, relatively minor. The, the moon is just toe dipping out, uh, through the outer, outer vestiges of the Earth's shadow. And it's only visible from the Eastern Hemisphere. So us here in the United States and North America don't get a chance to see it. Mm. Uh, but you can watch it uh, uh, live uh, and, and in video recaps um, through the virtual telescope and maybe some other folks um, that might be live streaming. And I bring that up 
just because it's a great weekend for sky watching. Not only do you have the full moon that's going to light up your, your weekends uh, and this eclipse to kind of uh, get you started, but there is the Eta Aquarian meteor shower this weekend that peaks uh, overnight tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and that are, you know, pieces of Halley's Comet uh, falling onto the earth and burning up in fireballs. And, uh, and so if, if you missed Halley's Comet in 1986, here's your chance to see little bits of it. Uh, that that come uh, by our, our neighborhood twice a year. And um, and I just wanted to point that out because, you know, it's easy to just skip it as we get ready to go see the, the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie or whatever else we're going to go check out uh, this weekend. Uh, but don't forget to look up. So that's my my spiel. For, well, thank uh, you. For you me. always bring a little overhead romance to our day. <laughs> um, and we are going to continue and uh, talk to the great Jeff Grayson in just a moment after a word from our sponsor, Bitwarden. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go, and is trusted by millions. Even our very own Steve Gibson has switched over. With Bitwarden, all of the data in your vault is end-to-end -end encrypted, not just your passwords. You can protect your data and privacy with Bitwarden by adding security to your passwords with strong randomly generated passwords for each account. You can go further with the username generator, create unique usernames for each account, or even use any of the five integrated email alias services. And Bitwarden has new features to announce in their latest release, including there will now be an alert when Bitwarden's autofill detects a different URI than the saved vault item, such as when an iframe is used for the login process. New users who create their accounts on mobile apps, browser extensions, and desktop apps can now check for known data breaches with their prospective master password via HIBP. Logging in with a device is now available for additional clients. Login requests can also be initiated from browser extensions, mobile apps, and desktop apps. And starting later this month, the Bitwarden application will begin alerting users if their KDF iterations are lower than the recommended default of 600,000 for PBKDF2. Argon 2ID is also an optional alternative for KDF for users seeking specialized protection. Finally, a stronger master password has a higher impact on security than KDF iterations, so you should have a long, strong, and unique master password for the best protection. Share private data securely with coworkers across departments or the entire company with fully customizable and adaptive plans. Bitwarden's Teams organization option is just $3 a month per user, while their enterprise organization plan is just $5 a month per user. And of course, individuals can always use the basic free account for an unlimited number of passwords. Upgrade at any time to a premium account for less than $1 a month or bring the whole family with their family organization option to give up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. At Twit, we're big fans of password managers, and Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and is trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. You can get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan, or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. So, Jeff, thanks for coming back. It's always great to have you. You're one, oh, of, the, great to be here. one of the most profound thinkers I know. And I'll, I'll stop there because I know how much you love it when I, when I wax, wax rhapsodic about your intellect. But uh, can you give us a little bit of uh, background about where you came from, what you've done? You've been involved with a number of groundbreaking ventures over the years. And just give us a little background, if you would. Um. Started my career in electrical engineering, graduated from Caltech, uh, first 10 years at uh, Intel, working to keep Moore's Law going and uh, developing chip technologies. Um, in the 90s, got uh, inspired by the Delta Clipper uh, and really um, uh, enraptured by this concept of, hey, if, if space made money, we could do a lot more of it. Uh, and decided to change careers, got into the commercial space business, uh, two years at Rotary Rocket. Uh, that company kind of sank under my feet and I inherited the rocket team and we turned that into X-Core Aerospace, which I uh, led for about 15 years and then uh, found myself out of a job. Uh, and not that long after watching the company disappear, 
and since then I've worked on advanced, more advanced concepts, basically things you do beyond chemical rockets, uh, wireless power for uh, cheaper Earth to orbit launch and um, the advanced space propulsion concepts for uh, the solar system and beyond. And I let me just backfill a little bit there for people who may not know the three systems you mentioned, uh, Delta Clipper, uh, Rotary Rocket, and x were all single stage to orbit spacecraft of one kind or another, if I remember correctly. Uh, well, x was single stage to suborbit. It was, suborbit, we, were, okay. we were not intending a single stage to orbit spacecraft. But not dropped from a plane. I mean, this thing took no, off from a runway like a, yes. like a commuter jet or something yeah and really of all those i mean they were all revolutionary in the way but rotary rocket had to be the wildest <laughs> having seen it up it's sitting up at the, the mojave airport now and you can go look at it and i mean what an idea you know this thing had helicopter blades on the top which were jet powered for initial ascent or was it for descent the, that concept changed enough times during the development cycle that I'd have to ask which date you were talking about. <laughs> um, okay. I do remember looking at it, seeing that small porthole in the pilot's position, thinking that would be a person with some serious steel in their spine. <laughs> yes, and it the, did have a flight test, correct? Yes. Well, the atmospheric test vehicle yeah. had, I think, uh, four flight tests. And I imagine they were exciting. I, I watched them from the boundary fence. I had been laid off by then, but <laughs> okay. Wow. All right. Well, that's, that's some cool stuff. And, um, you know, if people want to learn more about it, we'll put some, some links in the show notes. So you kind of explained what you did and you just threw off, Oh, I graduated from Caltech and graduating from Caltech is, is no mean feat to ask anybody who's tried it and failed. Uh, but, um, how does one go from what you were doing at Intel to getting into space? I mean, you kind of touched on it, but it literally, was it just seeing the Delta Clipper that McDonnell Douglas was experimenting with and saying, I, I got to get into that. That's exciting stuff. No, there's a little more to it. I mean, most of the company founders of a certain age, um, if you scratch the surface, you'll find somebody who kind of, grew up expecting we would live in the world of Apollo and Star Trek and at some point got really pissed off uh, that that wasn't happening. Uh, you know, for me, uh, I was at Caltech while one of my professors uh, was on the accident investigation board for the Challenger accident. Uh, and that really kind of left me going, you know, it doesn't matter whether I write my congressman to give money or money for NASA, they're, they're never going to get me off this planet. Um, uh, so, you know, went off and have my career and what the significance of the Delta Clipper was, people don't remember that now, but, you know, it was kind of the first vertical landing, uh, demonstrator on, or on earth. Um, and, but more importantly, you know, it was a vehicle that the NASA cost model said would take about a billion and a half dollars to build and the air force built it for a hundred million. <laughs> and so that was, you know, the, the the first major real crack in the armor that maybe just because NASA says something is too hard to do, that might not be the last word on the subject. Uh, so it was more of that change in the, in the mental landscape of what was possible that was brought on by DCX that, that got me interested in doing it. And, you know, has to, I actually did it. I drove down to the Oregon state university library every weekend and, read every book that they had on aerospace engineering and read every issue of the journal and spacecraft and rockets from volume one, issue one up to the then present and taught myself what was going on with the technology in the field and gave some papers at annual conferences where people discussed commercial space. And after a couple of years of that, I was recruited to take on the rocket engine development tasks at Rotary Rocket because it's hard to remember now, but at that time there really wasn't anybody left in the United States who designed who is still of working career age who'd ever designed a rocket engine you know it was they'd mm. all retired uh so we had to kind of rebuild that expertise by reading the old reports and in some cases by making the old mistakes again and you were also uh, on the augustine commission right correct yes Can yes you just uh, tell us a little bit about what what that was that was one of you know about every eight years um there's a presidential commission to ask the question, 
now that we've beaten the Russians to the moon, what should we do with NASA? Um, you know, they, they, the first one of those was in 1968 and they keep on happening. Uh, and they all give very more or less similar recommendations. And then Congress mostly ignores them. Uh, so the, we, we, we made recommendations that basically was NASA's budget net cannot afford a traditionally procured by and for NASA rocket, uh, plus a buy and for NASA capsule plus a buy and for NASA lander. Uh, so as soon as you put all three of those programs in the budget, the annual run rate of keeping them all running becomes more than NASA's human spaceflight budget will bear. Um, and so here we are today, more than a decade later, uh, NASA having built a buy and for NASA rocket and a buy and for NASA capsule and having discovered that they don't actually have enough budget for a traditional lander. Um, so, uh, I take no pr pleasure in having forecast to the obvious, uh, but you know, here we are. <laughs> okay. That, that was like the biggest fighting is like, you can go to the moon, but you can't land or Hey, you can land, but you can't go to the moon, but that's what you got, you know? <laughs> well, you, 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 you could, I mean, that, that, that was the real tragedy was, you know, all did, although we were not, we were not tasked with, nor did we provide the one path forward. The, the sad part of the whole thing was it was pretty obvious to me, uh, and there's data in the report to substantiate this, that we didn't need the buy in for a NASA rocket. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that you could, you could procure the launch services from the state of the American launch industry, even as it was in 2009. And of course, the state of the American launch industry has only improved since the 2009 era. Um, so, you know, it would have been possible to not procure the booster, to buy the launch services, and to uh, uh, then build the capsule and the lander. And that would have fit within NASA's budget, but that's not the path that Congress chose for us to pursue. Yeah, yeah. Ugh. So you've always been a big thinker uh, in the years I've known you and, and your chosen field of endeavor, at least when, when you have your choice to sort of stretch is interstellar propulsion. And I, I think it's fair to say exploration. And you and I are both on the board of the Tau Zero Foundation, which is focused on that. But you talk to a lot of members of the public, even the space interested public about it. And, you know, the reaction you often get is, well, you know, we've only made it to the moon with human beings. We got a long way to go. Why are you guys even thinking about that yet? Why are you thinking about that now? Well, the most prosaic answer is I was asked to think about it. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, I, I'm contributing a chapter to a, to a book and was asked to think about the, the mechanics of how would you actually do it. Um, but the, the deeper question is, okay, yes, we went to the moon early by any rational standard. You know, the, the, the exigencies of geopolitics got the United States to put in an amount of money into going to the moon that we're not likely to spend again real soon. Um, and one way or the other, we're likely to be going back soon. But in parallel with this, you know, our, our remote sensing and telescopic observations of other solar systems continues to improve. And a lot of people, myself included, think, you know, someday we're gonna get a detection of an exoplanet that's really, really interesting. You know, that looks like it might harbor life or looks like it might harbor something technical or looks like it might you know, have, have be a good place for humans to live. Um, and when that happens, you know, we want to have the answer ready of, okay, what would you do next? Uh, would you send a mission? Would you, would you send people? How might that happen someday? Um, I'm not going to talk about it in detail today because we have other things to talk about, but you know, I, I work on the propulsion part mostly of how you physically get objects to other star systems in some reasonable amount of time for some reasonable amount of money. And you can't think about that too long without thinking, okay, well, what's the payload look like? You know, what, how, how big is the mission? What are the requirements? How, what does it have to do? And that gets into this question of, okay, what are you going to do in the other solar system when you get there? Um, for robotic missions, you know, that, that's one set of problems. Do you go into orbit around the other star? How do you maneuver? What kind of instruments do you carry? What kind of communication systems does it take to get the data back? because, you know, it isn't useful until we get the data back. Um, and for people, it's a whole another set of problems, which I think uh, is worth starting to think about, not because we're going to do it next Tuesday, 
but we are working at this moment on propulsion systems and having some idea of what's the problem, what's the payload, what would it, you know, if you're going to move people to another star, how much, how many people, how big is that, how long does it take, what does that look like, um, sizes the requirements for propulsion, and that's why I find it worth thinking about. My propulsion. I mean, I, you mentioned it earlier that you, you we had other things to talk about. I want to talk about interstellar propulsion. <laughs> I don't know how about you. You know, when when, when people you, you you mentioned it earlier, Jeff, about Star Trek and and like you know we we're not there and and why why aren't we there? And that's the question that we get a lot is like when it comes to like interstellar travel is like why aren't we out there? It's sixty years we've been flying people in space, you know, and, and we've, we've barely gotten as far as the moon. And, uh, and so, you know, why, why don't we have a warp drive yet? Is that what you're building in your lab then when you're designing no, things out there? <laughs> I'm, I'm working strictly on slower than light stuff at the present time. Um, so, I mean, just to put it in perspective, the, the, if you total up all the academic institutions and all the nonprofits and all the channels of NASA or ESA funding, um, there's probably 10 million with an M dollars a year of research activity going on worldwide on advanced space propulsion beyond chemical rockets. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's peanuts. Uh, is it, but is, is it just because it's easy? Like you mentioned earlier, like the, the, the shift between, uh, well, Delta Clipper, right? The, the, here was a rocket. It did, it did its test. That was it. And then for like decades, no one did anything, you know, with that. We just had the conventional uh, launch and throw away until now we see, you know, SpaceX and, and others are, are really pursuing it seriously because they've shown that it can be done. Is that like a case study? I think in some sense it is part of, you know, before, before people will fund an effort, they have to have some reason to think it's a thing that they can do. And, you know, so the, the value of the advanced work that I and others are doing on advanced space propulsion right now is to expand the intellectual limits of, of people understanding what might we actually be able to do. Uh, you know, uh, I don't think you're going to see a major uptick in funding because, after all, it's hard to make money from sending a probe to another star. Um, so if it's going to be done, it's going to be done on a public good basis. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's going to be hard, but I, hard for people to get a lot of funding there. Although one can say, you know, there is, a tr there is spillover between advanced space propulsion for any purpose and any other purpose. You know, the, the ideas you come up with for going interstellar flight, um, any of them that are any good enhance your ability to maneuver around the solar system as well and there might be customers for that um but you know getting into the whole you know people people on the street really uh overestimate the amount of support there is for advanced uh research really in almost any field mm -hmm. uh there, there's a few high profile fields where for historical or political reasons, there's a lot of money poured into them. But, you know, in, in most research is done by people because they're interested in the answer, uh, not so much because there's all these people throwing money at them to find the answer. So, so, so you mentioned then for, for interstellar travel, you're focusing on, on slower than light. So what are like the, I guess, your major go-tos right now? What could we use uh, that we're okay. looking at actively to, to reach another star? I mean, I guess conventional fuel, but you would need something the size of like, I don't know, like, a, like Earth. a football stadium, <laughs> a stand oh. planet to get there. Okay. Well, this uh, so was what? not, this was, this was not the topic I thought we were going to discuss today, but, but I'm happy to do it. But oh, I'm sorry. Ron, I'm sorry. I'm, right? I'm no, just, no, no, I'm no, enthralled it's, uh, by I, it. So. Uh, I, I could, uh, maybe, maybe you can have me back another time. Uh, the, um, you know, that what I, uh, in very briefly, what I recommend is if you're interested in the subject or your viewers are interested in the subject. If you look at the last few years of the conference, the Interstellar Research Group or Tennessee Valor Interstellar Workshop, um, there's a whole slew of technical papers that have been given on that over the last years, some by me, some by many other people. Um, and, uh, you know, progress is being made. Uh, the, 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 it's a lot of energy, any way you slice it. It's a lot of energy, a lot of kinetic energy wrapped up in an object moving at 20 or 30% of the speed of light. 
Um, and so the name of the game is to harness natural sources to get as much of that energy into your spacecraft as possible because you didn't have to pay for it all. Um, and you know, there's been progress. It's all low technology already in this level, early conceptual design stuff, um, but it obeys the laws of physics. Um, and there are avenues of approach. And I would love to see some serious work going on on that because, you know, if you'd said, if you'd had me, if you asked me this question 10 years ago, I would have basically had to say, there's nothing to invest in. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no good ideas that really look promising that you'd be worth ready to develop. That's different now. You know, there, there, there are two or three or four or five parallel approaches that you could look at and say, each one of those has merit. Each one of those might be part of the final solution. You know, let's start working on all of them. So over the years, you know, growing up, seeing Star Trek and later Star Wars, of course, warp drive was just a, a button push away. They make it look so easy, of course, along with button push gravity and all that kind of thing. But uh, over that same period of time, we've seen more serious efforts. There's been people that looked at fusion drives, of course, which are still kind of elusive, very elusive. Uh, the Broussard drive, which vacuumed up, I guess, interstellar hydrogen and used that for for propulsive um, mass and a lot of other things at this point i'm wondering what you see as the most promising technology because i've seen you know you said a brilliant thing years ago which is it's all about energy it sounds simple but it's kind of an interesting explanation you know you've talked about beamed energy propulsion i've seen you talk about other things that were more living off the land if you will on your way what do you see as the most promising avenue I, I would never just pick one because um, the, you know, when you're managing a technology, when you're trying to do a difficult thing, you, you better have multiple parallel paths that look like they might get you there because you never know which ones are going to wind up working out. Uh, so um, all of the paths that you mentioned have, have a role to play. You know, beamed energy has a role to play. Uh, that's a good way to shoot small things and it might be a good way to send streams of pellets that you use later in the propulsion system for as part of your propulsion strategy. Um, so you send uh, them ahead of the spacecraft? Or behind, depending on how fast they're going. Yeah, um, there's a concept um, called the, the cog railway or the, the, the wind pellet shear sailing, where you run over the pellets and you, and you push on them as you go by to provide the reaction mass that pushes the spacecraft forward. Oh, um, like, like leapfrog almost. Yes. Oh, wow. Um, there's a, there's a concept that we just published at the last TVIW conference um, called um, a dynamic soaring where you like a, like a soaring bird, you go out to the edge of the solar system and you turn back and forth in and out between the solar wind and the interstellar medium. And you can pick up, an increment of velocity, like bouncing off the solar wind every time you do that. Uh, and you can get up to about 2% of the speed of light that way without <laughs> spending any propellant. Um, the there's uh, fusion rockets are not out. They look very promising, uh, but they only get you about 5% of the speed of light. Um, you know, there's another concept that I was part of the development of called the, the wind drive or the Q drive or the plasmodyne jet, uh, where you, you basically run, as you run through the interstellar medium, it's a wind, you extract the energy from that wind and you use it to expel reaction mass that you carry it on board the vehicle. But that works better if the faster you're going when you start, the more you get out of that because the wind speed is higher. So it works better as a second stage where some of these other technologies work better as a first stage. So it's not, it's not like we're looking for the one magic one thing We're we're looking to build up an armamentarium of, of concepts that look credible that, that where if one of them didn't work, you wouldn't be dead in the water. You, your development program could continue with, with the other ones that look more promising at that time. It's like, like real sci-fi stuff <laughs> that you're talking about. That's crazy. So, it feels like. But, yeah. I don't know. That Pac-Man, that Pac-Man pellet pooping 
I like that one. That that, that sounds like fun. <laughs> so, you, you make it sound so sophisticated. Well, I mean, that's my job, right? Is to try yeah. to explain it to people. Tell me, so it's, it seems like there's a, a lot of different avenues, um, Jeff, that humanity could take uh, for these. But what's like um, uh, uh, a standard, if there is such a thing, timeline for an interstellar, either either for us to get that capability or, or for a, like a mission that we should be planning for in the interim. Cause I guess like the first probes, they're not going to have people on them, right? We're not, no, certainly know, not the, you know, you know and you, these, these are like hundreds of years long or decades long that you're looking at or the, the, I'm not a big believer in the, in the multi-generational starship concept. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the money has a time value, whether you're talking about for profit or not for profit ventures. And, you know, so spending a little more money to go faster and get the, get whether what you want back is data or whether you want, whether you want people delivered to the other system, you know, the, the amount of time it takes for that investment to pay off is part of the calculation. Uh, so, but even so with achievable slower than light speeds, you're talking about decades of mm -hmm. travel time to a nearby star. Um, and that's so, one way, right? You would have to slow down if you want to stop well, i would assume right you, you do um yeah. and that's part of the concept most of the concepts for that are breaking against the interstellar medium um uh, not not doubling your amount of delta v you have to put into the vehicle propulsively uh -huh. that would be a little silly um uh and again whether for science or whether for you're taking a payload to the other star system um you know you get so much more return on your investment by reaching in orbit around the other star than you do by just flying by at interstellar speeds a flyby is very fast mm -hmm. you know it, it, you, you get minutes of of transit transit time uh past the target in the other system if you don't stop um and you know are you really going to fund a, a voyager class mission that that takes the costs like voyager costs and takes 40 years to get there and get three minutes of data back. I view this as an <laughs> unlikely outcome. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, before we would think about sending people, you know, we, we have all kinds of sophisticated telescopic observations to do, um, to identify an interesting target. Um, there's the potential for getting even better that way with advanced space propulsion for doing solar gravitational lens telescopic observations where you can get really good pictures once you know what you're looking for. Um, and then, you know, some kind of unmanned probe. Um, but, you know, it costs real money. Uh, you know, the, the, the most cost effective scheme that I have seen published um, might come out at like $30 million a ton. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's comparable to the price it costs today to put something on the lunar surface. Uh, and you know, that's the price you might get to after a lot of development was done, mm -hmm. not, not, not tomorrow. Um, so, uh, yeah, you're going to send something that's an unmanned probe, uh, first before you even think about sending people, you're not going to send people, people are not going to sign up for a 30 year mission, um, without some reason to believe there's something there to go to. Uh, so certainly you'd expect a robotic mission to have gone before you send people anywhere. And like the, like those decades, I mean, are we talking just like initially to like Alpha Centauri, which is you know four light years away? That's like the nearest system is what we're looking at right now. Or yes, are, are there any any other feasible places that we could look at? Oh uh, yeah, uh, there there's there's a dozen or so good targets within uh you know a uh, a twelve or fifteen light year radius of the mm -hmm. Earth. Um, uh, so you know there's places to go, uh, and we can get faster, you know, it, it, it doesn't, again, because of the energy cost involved, it doesn't actually make a lot of sense to try to get to Alpha Centauri much faster than about 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. Your, your mission gets progressively more expensive and the difference between 50 years and 20 years is a big deal. It's a much bigger deal than the distance between 50, 20 and 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, but the energy cost keeps scaling up the faster you go. Um, so, you know, it's not a generation ship, but if you think when you get to the point where you're thinking about sending people, it's a it's a one generation long mission. Mm -hmm. You know, the the, the you're 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 going to be kind of old by the time you get there. It's your, <laughs> it's your it's your kids who are going to be, and it's 
if we're with as long as we're confined to slower than light travel, it's a one way trip. You know, you're you're not coming back. <laughs> uh, so the but you know that's as I'm fond of talking about. You know, this is not a new thing in the human experience. The the you know when when the Polynesians sent people out to an island, if they found an island, they didn't come home. Uh, you know, they just stayed there. Uh, and then a generation later, they would send people back to tell people that they had found something worth going to, uh, and and uh, you know further settlers would follow. Um, you know that that's the part of this that that I think is worth doing a little thinking about. Not again because we just want to write a great science fiction story, but because we want to have some idea what does it take. Uh, you know, and there's been a lot of loose thinking. Um, in the popular literature about what does it take? Uh, you know, I've seen apparently sober people, uh, you know, write scientific papers that say, you know, you have to have thousands of people on your mission in order to do an interstellar settlement. And all I can do with there is shake my head and go, how was it that the Polynesians managed to settle, you know, New Zealand with a hundred people? Uh, and, and what, what happened to the, to the human, human being? in an evolutionary sense that the minimum viable population used to be a hundred and now it's 3000. I don't get it. Um, you know, plus we have, you know, one of the big uncertainties in thinking about this is what changes in biotechnology are going to be available. Uh, you know, there's already been a big one since the Polynesian days to today, right? In the Polynesian era, if you wanted more genetic diversity in your population, you had to go back and bring more people to get that additional genetic diversity. You know, we, we can freeze genetic material. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, you can send, imagine sending a population that has a small number of, of people in the founding population, but each successive generation can enhance the genetic diversity, even if no new people arrive because you bring genetic material with you. Um, you know, that, that one change right there, makes a big difference in how big of a population you think you need to bring to establish an interstellar settlement. Um, you know, a, a big unknown is, can we develop something like torpor or hibernation uh, for the people? And, and the reason this is such a big variable, let's go, let's back up a step and think about what does actually <laughs> mean to send people, right? You have to bring some kind of habitat. Right. You're not you're not going to put the spam in the can for 30 years. <laughs> uh, the the so that habitat has to have spin gravity. And it has to have radiation shielding and the radiation shielding completely dominates the mass of the mission. Um, so the amount of habitable volume that you have to live in while you are in transit. Sizes the radiation shielding. And that's why there's a big drive, if you think about interstellar settlement, to make the population that travels from A to B take up as little space as possible. Uh, and the advantage of something like torpor or hibernation would be, you know, if you could have half your crew asleep at any one time, uh, you know, they, they take up very little volume that way. Uh, uh, the, you know, this is going to sound, all this stuff is going to sound a little weird, because we're many generations now removed from the last time that human beings set out, you know, to settle some new area and weren't expecting to come back. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that's, that's the majority of the human experience, but it's not the majority of the written part of human history. Uh, you know, so it sounds weird thinking about going on a one-way mission, it sounds weird to say what I'm about to say next, which is, you know, you probably um, start having kids before you get to your target because um, your founding population is getting older. You know, you can't, with current biotechnology, you can't have kids forever. Uh, so you, you need to start having your second generation before you get there. But, you know, when they're, in their first two years, they don't take a lot of space. Uh, you know, <laughs> they, they don't need, you don't need that big of an area for them to run around in. Uh, uh, so, 
one of the concepts that I that I am playing with for this is what I call the just add water habitat. You know, if you if you bring a large habitat with you, but you don't bring the radiation shielding for most of that volume, most of it's just pre-built space that you could expand into later. Um, there are very few, we can't really imagine a solar system you could get to that doesn't have some conveniently accessible place to get water, uh, you know, from moons or cometary bodies or asteroids or what have you. Um, so if you planned to the first thing that you did when you arrived in a system to get water or shielding material to provide the radiation shield and habitat volume, now all of a sudden you can bring 10 times the habitat volume for the same weight. Yeah. Because you you pick up most of the weight that it needs to function as a habitat after you arrive at the destination star system. Um, so excuse me one second. I, yes. I've got questions and I want you to continue, but we do have to take a break for our sponsors and we will be right back. So if you've got more to say on that, I, I want to give you time to continue before we're done today. But I do want to move on to something that we had decided we were going to talk about, which is the big why. And and I kind of touched on this at the beginning. You talk to the guy on the street and you say, we're going to go to, to see exoplanets. And they go, why would we do that? Well, when I was a kid, just for one reason, the solar system was a much, much more desirable place for people. It was Beverly Hills. You know, you had Mars next door that might have a dense enough atmosphere to, to live in if you had oxygen uh, with you and Venus might have swamps and dinosaurs and all this kind of stuff that really from the 18th to the mid 19th century didn't change that much. And then I'm simplifying this a bit, but with the advent of Mariner 4 going past Mars and the other Mariner going past Venus, it was a disappointing afternoon and the solar system turned into a, a forlorn trailer park suddenly and was no longer quite the paradise we had thought we were going to be. It, it all got a lot harder. It all got a lot less desirable. Then for decades, you know, there were incremental advances. Uh, we got to the outer solar system, saw that the news was even worse, discovered and realized that radiation is a much more profound threat than we thought. But now we're seeing exoplanets and we're getting to the point we're going to be able, are able to start seeing what their atmospheres are all about and we'll eventually be able to observe their surfaces. So, you know, given all this, can you talk a little bit about the big why? Because I've heard you speak very eloquently about things like the Polynesian expansion and so forth. There seems to be a human nature. Uh, it's in our very genes to do this. But what do you think are the big imperatives here? Historically or in prehistory or through anthropology, you know, what we can say, we can see some common themes in why people go off to live in, you know, places nobody has ever managed to live in before. Um, you know, one of them is just access to energy and resources. You know, the, the, your, your homeland is, is perceived to be lacking in opportunity. You have, you know, landless children of your, of your nobles who are troublesome. Um, they, they'd <laughs> like to, they'd like to go get a chance to, to try someplace new. Um, one of them is, and that, that same factor also appears as, you know, um, you, you, many societies have found it to be adaptive to have a place for people who are too much trouble to keep at home to go. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Vikings and the Polynesians both have the different flavors of this concept of, we're going to send you to sea. Uh, mm. the, you know, we're not going to, we're, you're. You're too politically important, too powerful, too rich for us just to kill you. Um, but you're too much trouble to keep at home. Uh, <laughs> the, you know, feel free to take some ships and all the people who will follow you and just go away. Uh, the, uh, you know, that's not a, that's not a, an adaptation we have in Western culture right now, but it's been a very successful one for the civilizations that have come up with it. And it's not impossible to foresee a time when there might be, you know, factions uh, and that no one of which can can necessarily triumph. But it, if you gave one of them the chance to go somewhere else, they might take it. Um, and another, a third one is just freedom, independence. You know, people have strange beliefs, strange customs, strange ideas 
Uh, they want they want to practice them. The people at home don't want to let them. Uh, you know, they they get up and go fine. I'm going to go to the valley, the next valley over. Uh, most of them don't work. It's worth pointing that out. You know, the most settlements are not successful. Uh, but people keep trying, and eventually, something sometimes they work. I think both of those points are like the 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 plot of Alan Steele's Coyote. Uh, <laughs> a sci-fi book where they go to another planet and perhaps an upcoming reality show. Well, you know, I, I would, I would, off, I, I would offer one more reason and we touched on it actually at the beginning of our episode with that, that story about the star that's eating its planet because you know, when you get, when you get down to it and, and Jeff, let me know this has come up in the stuff, the work that you've been doing, but we've got one basket that like all of our eggs are in. We've got one, one star and like I had to have a very uncomfortable conversation with my three-year-old when she was that young, you know, it's going to swallow the, the planet eventually. And if there are any humans around in, you know, 4 billion years or so, that's going to be a bad day, right? If we haven't figured out another way to, I guess, exist beyond that, that what the star that we have, right? I mean, is that, but is that a compelling enough reason um, to, to, to push this in the long run, that's why Elon Musk is pushing SpaceX to Mars. He's said that a lot of times about become a, a multi-planetary I think, system. Okay, I, it's a reason I find compelling, and I'll go into a little bit about why. Um, but but you could also just say, before I go into the reasons why I find it compelling that are kind of rational, um, you know, why do grasses and birds also... Um, find ways to drift or fly across oceans to colonize, you know, the, a vol- barren volcanic rock that just came out of the ocean. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they don't, they don't have a sophisticated rationale of, of rewards and prices and return on investment uh, that, that drives them to do that. What drives them to do that is evolutionary selection. The, the species that have developed the habit of propagating themselves into new ecological niches when they are successful are the successful species. Because, you know, I'm paraphrasing Carl Sagan here, but you know, uh, rich harvests and, and mild winters, you know, don't last forever. Uh, there, there's always, there's always an next problem around the corner. There's always the next earthquake, an next volcano, an next meteor strike, you know, an next climate change phenomenon, the next ice age, uh, you know, the, the, the illusion that people have at any one time of of the natural state of the earth as being some kind of unchanging stasis uh and we we view any any change in the steady state as an unnatural thing that's just wrong the change change is the constant uh the so you know the the there there is something primal you know below the conscious level that I think people embody of, you know, we not, we may not have any idea as individuals why it's been evolutionary successful to have these people over three Sigma on the distribution who just never seem happy where they are and always seem to be looking for the next place to go. Um, but the truth is all species that are successful in the long run have members of, of that species the, or seeds or birds or whatever it is that go off and look for someplace new uh, to be, because otherwise we wouldn't know about them. They'd have died out. Uh, uh, but I do have a rational element to it. And, and it's, it's not anything as esoteric as waiting 4 billion years for the sun to go out. You know, mm-hmm. the, 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 um, the, the, over the last about 4,000 years, um, for any given civilization that you might be living in, the just doing the statistics, the chance that, that in any given year that the civilization that you're in will be gone next year is about one in four hundred. One uh, in four hundred. About one in four hundred. <laughs> oh the, put the, the put another way, the mean time between failure of civilizations is about three hundred years. See, see, if um, I didn't have existential dread about the sun swallowing the earth, I have it now about humanity being like a cosmically. Well, but successful but species, <laughs> but, but don't, but don't, don't view it as negative. It's not a negative civilizations fall all the time. Um, you know, the, the, the Rome fell a long time ago, but there's no shortage of Italians in Italy. 
uh, the, the civilization falling is not a species ending event. Um, but we are in a historically unique, vulnerable window right now because the advance of technology and the advance of trade and communications has essentially created one planetary civilization. Uh, if it goes down, it may go down all over at the same time. That's a risk. That's, that's a risk that we haven't faced in the previous history of civilization. Um, and, and there is urgency in getting to the point where we are not in that situation anymore, where civilization is present in multiple places that may be in communication, but where the, where the costs and delays and difficulty of transportation between them is enough that they are independent outposts of civilization. Um, and therefore, if one of them went down, they wouldn't all necessarily go down. Uh, for I believe that there is a future in doing that in the solar system. Um, but, uh, you know, if I'm right, even if I'm right, a century later, and the solar system will just all look like one big civilization and people <laughs> will still be asking where do we go next? <laughs> uh, so the, you know, the, 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 mar the beat goes on, man, the, the, the uh, you know, it, it, it'll, even if I'm most optimistic, it'll take us a couple hundred thousand years to fill up the Milky Way. And by the time that we, uh, that we do that, maybe we'll have some idea how to tackle the problem of intergalactic travel. Uh, so I, I've got a bunch of He's, questions. He said, left. he said <laughs> intergalactic travel there, uh, yeah, I not, know. not interstellar. Oh. Had quite purposefully chosen, I'm sure. Um, I, I'm going to have to skip over my favorite part of this conversation, which is turning us all into robo roaches, so we're smaller, have extra arms, and are easier to transport around. But I, I have to move on to the thought of. So we're talking about you know human seeding the solar system, and this is something that mammals do very well. They reproduce like crazy. And if we're human, we love doing so. It's just part of our makeup and part of our our imperative and you know, we kind of never get over it, even as we age. So, you know, this seems to be a natural progression for us. But of course, there is a significant percentage of population that feels that we shouldn't, that we shouldn't continue doing to the rest mm -hmm. of the solar system and other star systems what we've done to Earth, which is utilized. Now, we may not have done it in the, the most benign and productive way, but that's what we do. You know, one point of view says we're a very successful mammalian species. Another point of view says we're parasites. And should parasites be spreading beyond? And that gets to the conversation of, okay, well, you know, we're going to Mars eventually. Do rocks have rights? Because it's likely there's not much else there. Or if there, if there was, it's either gone, or if there is, it's microbial. So just in sort of a, a blanket statement, you know, this, this, the go west young man thing doesn't really work for us anymore, right? A lot of space advocates have used that for years. You've got better rationales behind that, some of which you've outlined. But what would you say to people that feel that it's, it's not good for us to expand, that we should stay here and sort of suffer the consequences? I'm looking for a, for an answer to that question, which I can put on a broadcast network without being bleeped. <laughs> um, there's a line in Inherit the Wind where, where the, the, pro, the attorney says to the, to the guy on the stand, you know, does a sponge think? And the, the guy says, well, I don't know if a sponge thinks, but if, he want, if, if God wants a sponge to think, a sponge thinks. Mm. And the attorney says, well, my client demands the same rights as a sponge. He deserves the right to think. Uh, you know, if, if the birds of the air and the grasses of the sea and, and the, the microbes of the earth have every right, uh, if, if that is a sentence that even makes sense, have every right to exist and every right to, to propagate themselves into any new ecosystem that they find where they can thrive. Um, I demand the same rights for humanity that we that we ascribe to grasses and plants and bacteria. Um, you know, if 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 they are allowed to expand their ecosystem, we are allowed to expand our ecosystem. Now, should the day come when we meet other sapient beings, you know, that's a very different conversation. Uh, uh, one which we have no reason to suspect we're going to have to face anytime soon. 
uh, you know, everything we see about the universe so far is it looks open for business. Uh, 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 and, you know, we, for all the reasons we've discussed, if we want not just our species, but our civilization to go on, um, it behooves us to spread that species and that civilization into as many different ecological niches as we can find a way to reach. Um, none of that calls for us to be an unwise steward of the environments that we find, right? It, it, the, the people who, you know, look, if, I know there are people out there who think humanity is a cancer. I don't think I'm a cancer. I don't think you're a cancer, but if you think you're a cancer, go solve that problem. Um, <laughs> the, Bingo. Um, you know, but, but, but that doesn't mean that we've always made wide dis wise decisions. And, and you don't have to think of human beings as an evil or a cancer to think that it makes sense for us to take care of our ecosystem. You know, this is our spacecraft. It has a life support system. It behooves us to maintain that life support system, not for abstract reasons, not because of some existential moral crisis that we pose, but because we live here. We should take care of it. Clean up your room. Uh, the, the, you know, this, there, there's no conflict between those points of view and the idea that, that there is one and only one species on this planet that at least some of the time is open to ethical persuasion. You know, the, the idea that the only species on this planet that is sometimes persuadable because of ethical or moral concerns is uniquely unfit uh or not allowed to to work for its advancement and propagation and long-term survival i find anathema well and i guess those settlers who go to another planet well it'll be in the same boat it'll be there that'll be, that'll be their room that they'll have yes. to keep that place clean and yes and, and and it'll have its own ways of working that they'll have to find the find their own way in way in one, one of the well. things about about space that truly excites me is that you know, we, we are probably not the, the apex of all possible development of human civilization today, you know, any more than the Romans were 2000 years ago. Uh, there are probably other social forms to be experimented with. There's probably other ways of living to be experimented with other ways of thinking to be experimented with. Um, that won't happen unless we can have, because most experiments fail, you know, mo lots of people went out to the Western United States to start weird cults and weird beliefs and weird practices. And where are they all today? Well, they're mostly gone. Uh, you know, we can't have the freedom to experiment with new ways of, of having a human society unless we have more than one human society. Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, people, people, of the kind of persuasion you're talking about will sometimes say things like, well, we have to change, you know, the very fundamentals of the way that a human society works, of the way that a human economy works, of the way that human technology works. And my take on that is you are utterly free to do that if you and your like-minded followers go somewhere else to try it. And my opinions about how likely that is to succeed or not are irrelevant <laughs> uh, because we don't know. We, that's the point of an experiment. You don't know what's going to happen before you try it. I may have a, I may have opinions about how likely some of those things are to work, but they're irrelevant. Go forth and try them. And, and if you, if you are successful, come back and teach us what, what, what worked so well. Great. Well, I guess, you know, just to wrap up, Jeff, you know, cause you mentioned earlier that there's like a bunch of places that we could go in a 15 light year radius of, of, I guess we'll call it soul, right? Instead of the sun. Um, and just, just briefly, because most people will just think, oh, we'll go to Alpha Centauri or, or maybe Proxima Centauri. That's a little bit closer, you know? Where would you want to go in that radius <laughs> to, oh. where, to, to go see? If you could pick the actual place that oh, we were going to send I, that first mission, where would you go to? Alpha Centauri. Yeah. The, 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 just because as of today, we haven't done all the kind of robotic and telescopic observation that we would go, that we would do before we went someplace. And, you know, we don't know anything about Alpha Centauri that makes it less interesting than average. 
uh, or, you know, so why not go to the closest place first? Maybe, maybe we'll find the space family Robinson rod, right? Isn't that where they were going to? So (laughs) you betcha with Will and Penny and Judy, who famously, as I recall in the show's pilot lost in space back in the sixties, gave up a promising acting career to join her family in space, which was, Oh, so 1966. Jeff, <laughs> thank you so much. It's always a mind expanding experience. I'm always a little, yeah, thanks, Aunt, <laughs> for the crickets. <laughs> it's always, it's always, I, I sweat a bit when we talk because you, you get me working. And uh, I'm sure we'll be working much, much harder than this on that article, but I look forward to it. Um, so, since you will one day be leading us into our interstellar adventure, where is the best place online for us to keep track of what you're up to? Um, I, I do publish, as I said, uh, occasional articles or technical studies at the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, now called the Interstellar Research Group. Um, those, are, those all show up on YouTube about six months after the conference. Um, I have a page on academia.edu where I post my technical papers. Um, as far as my day job, you know, this is all my, what I do on the on the with my left hand. Uh, my day job uh, is developing lower cost ways of getting from the Earth into space uh, that are also less environmentally uh, questionable than infinitely large numbers of flights of infinitely large rockets. Um, and uh, that work you can follow occasionally on uh, our website at Electric Sky. Okay, and for those of you who are looking him up and don't happen to find our show notes, it's Jeff Grayson, G R E A S O N, and you'll you'll find a lot of fascinating stuff there. And if you can understand the papers completely, you're a better man than me, Tarek. <laughs> yes, well, you can you. find me at at space dot com as always, uh, and on on Twitter at Tarek J Malik. Uh, the J this week stands for uh, just going camping. I will be out in the hills of New Jersey this weekend and maybe uh, I'll see a, a shooting star. We'll see. We'll see. That'd be great. The savage wilds of New Jersey. <laughs> and of course, you can always find me at pilebooks.com and at astromagazine.com where we post our magazine. Please don't forget to drop us a line at twist at twit TV. That's TWIS at twit.tv. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and ideas, and jokes. And boy, did we get some good ones this week, so keep it up. Uh, We just love it. Don't forget to check out space.com, the websites and the name, and the National Space Society at nss.org. Both are good places to satisfy your space flight cravings, and there you will find your tribe, as Tarek and I have. Uh, I also want to mention that the National Space Society's International Space Development Conference, which I have discussed before, will be uh, taking place at the end of May from the 25th to the 28th, just outside Dallas, Texas. If you're interested in that, which you should be, um, it's the website is isdc2023.nss.org. And if you do come, please be sure to come by and say hello or tell me a bad space joke. New <laughs> episodes of this podcast publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher. So make sure to subscribe, tell your friends, give us reviews, five stars, thumbs up. A nod of your handsome head. We'll take it. We'll take it all. And you can head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. Don't forget, you can get all the great programming on the Twit Network ad free on Club Twit, as well as some extras. It's a secret, but you should go see them <laughs> at, uh, at, at Club Twit for just $7 a month, which is a bargain no matter how you slice it. And you can also follow the Twit Tech Podcast Network at Twit on Twitter and on Facebook and twit.tv on Instagram. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you next week. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here. In case you hadn't heard, Home Theater Geeks is back. Each week, I bring you the latest audio video news, tips and tricks to get the most out of your AV system, product reviews, and more. You can enjoy Home Theater Geeks only if you're a member of Club Twip, which costs seven bucks a month. Or you can subscribe to Home Theater Geeks by itself for only $2.99 a month. I hope you'll join me for a weekly dose of Home Theater Geekitude.